I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about the difference between privileged access management and IM because they do look on the face of them to be the same. And I'm going to take some of my presentation from the journeys that I've experienced with our customers where they've gone from quite often chaos to control. And I'm also going to talk about how PAM yeah, affects a different set of accounts that the IAM accounts affect. So let's see what happens. Um, these are the three journeys that I'm going to talk about. Chaos to control, incident to good practice, good practice to bad practice. But to start with, IAM and PAM look the same, but they're very different. So the IAM users, and I think we saw a great demo from BBC, the IAM users are coming in on your normal user interface. So if we thought about an e-commerce company, the users are either coming in as customers, or they're coming in as order processors, or they're coming in as line managers. Whereas PAM users, privilege access managers, are going in at a completely different level. They're going in on the, main, the management interface. And what's important about those two different interfaces comes down to what happens in breaches, what happens in a data breach. Data breaches, all, all except for one incident, um, is all except for one incident that I'm aware of, uh, always go through privileged accounts. They don't go through normal user accounts. When you log into a normal website, when you look onto Amazon as a normal user, you can't breach Amazon. You, know, you have to go somewhere else. Whereas PAM users enter through management interfaces, and if you're aware of the kind of stack of technology that runs underneath your systems, if you imagine entering at the ESI, ESXi interface, that's the virtual interface, it means that you can copy things very quickly. Um, I was on the board of a company that was breached, actually, by their, uh, by their cloud service provider. Uh, an admin went rogue in one of the cloud service providers and took a 16,000 customer database in 12 seconds. So when you've got stuff up in the cloud, your ability to move a hell of a lot of stuff very, very quickly is really prevalent. And it's interesting that the, the statistics that we heard this morning, which is showing, they said 74% attacks come from external, which means that 26 of them, 26% of attacks are now coming internally. And we're seeing this situation where organizations are not just the organization anymore, they're the organizations and all their third party providers. And the third party providers is often where I, we end up talking about engagement, about how to get those third party providers in and out, in and out of privileged accounts with a reasonable degree of safety. Um, the other thing is PAM users tend to use loads of accounts because they use the accounts on systems that exist before IAM does. So if you imagine that we had a server up on the stage that we just unpacked from Dell, um, it's got a set of default accounts on it and they exist before IAM exists and then we have to go through privilege access management, we bring the thing up, then we add the IAM. But the identity that an IAM provider gives us is very important to PAM, and I'll come to that um, at some point. So the first journey, chaos to control. Um, we've come across this a lot of times. It's often driven when one company buys several others. Uh, a company, uh, you know, maybe lists or maybe makes a great profit and then starts on a process of buying other companies. And what happens is you get a mismatch of administration departments, a mismatch of third party providers, and often the quickest way to become operational is to create trust relationships between your AD groups. And when you create trust relationships between your AD groups, you, it's very easy to lose track of who has access to what. And then you come across accounts that haven't been used for years, and the one that frightens everybody is service accounts. People look at service accounts and go, if I change that password on that service account, what's going to break? Um, if I remember it, service accounts and things like vulnerability scanners are really important. Incident to good practice. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm the chief technical officer, but I can tell you that our sales team love to hear somebody who's just had an incident because it normally means it's a fast buying signal often driven from an inside attack, ex-employee threat, or, as we see more and more these days, management recognising that they just had a near miss. You know, management realising, or you know, picking something up and going, my goodness, their entire database is on that. The other ones that typical, typically happen is pen tests show you things, audit fails, 
things like that. So that's a, a, another journey. And actually, one of the more common journeys that, that we find in our customer base is going from good practice to best practice. And this is where you get into some really interesting conversations about what your ISO 27000 and 9000 things tell you to do and what your instincts tell you are wrong. Um, in these particular environments, we often find PCI compliance and we often find a really good CISO and compliance officer working together. In fact, sometimes you find CISOs and operational people working together, which uh, yeah, you might think is unheard of, but I, I know of a whole pile of companies that are really quite good at that. So if you analyse your IT delivery system from one end to the other, if you pick any point in the chain, it will look simple, okay? If you then look at that chain, what's before and after it, then it starts to look complicated. If you add some humans into the situation, it becomes complex, and then all you've got to do is add too many humans, put in errors in, and a bit of malware, and you drop into chaotic behavior. And the thing about chaotic IT systems is they are not manageable. And one of our jobs, really, one of all of our jobs, really, is to make these systems manageable. So it's our job to reverse this entropy from simple, complicated, complex, through to chaotic. Um, and if I remember it, there's this little, uh, which one should I walk to? I'll wander over here. Um, if you can see this, there's this little uh, yellow arrow here. And this, this is actually the Kinefin diagram. And this little yellow arrow here is a reminder to all of us managers, is if you think you're managing a simple system that's chaotic, you actually fall off a cliff. Um, and that's when you lose control of everything. Uh, threat analysis, because I hate doing these scary slides, but I have to do these scary slides, just to remind us all. Credentials, 86% of all credentials are simply stolen off the desktop. It's that easy. And there are reasons for this, and it's all down to, it's all down to us managers making our poor people have to remember more and more and more things and making the password policy ever more complicated, which forces them into writing it down. 10% are fished, 4% are brute forced. That 10% and 4% change on a regular basis. They, they slide up and down. And interestingly, the more complex you make your password policy, the easier it is to brute force a password. It seems counterintuitive, but that's the way it works. There's a couple of um, diagrams here. Uh, one of them is what happens when you get people to generate passwords and what happens when you get systems to generate passwords. The resolution is not really good enough for you to see, but what it shows me is that people tend to use, over the last few years, the year in their password. So it's obvious to me that people are using year and month in their password because you've told them they've got to change their password every month and they can't remember it. So they use the same password and then they put the year and the month on the end. And I have just seen a little sea of nods. Right? I, I, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I know there's lots of different strategies for doing these things. Um, so that's the difference between those. And just so we know, um, I, did want, I did want to call this slide the bloody obvious. Um, and that is that people are very inconsistent when they're entering commands into a system, but they're incredibly consistent when they have to choose their passwords. Um, and then you've got to recognize that some of your endpoints, and if they're not your endpoints, your third party endpoints are compromised. We lost that battle years ago. If you have a thousand Windows systems at any point in time, 10 of those are compromised. Your problem is, of course, you don't know which 10 they are, and the 10 tend to shift around. And it gives you this issue of malware, the malware updating. The malware updating literally has to happen on a minute-by-minute -minute basis these days, which is why you've got lovely products like McAfee EPO that can serve these updates out at the speed of light, which is really important. Um, there's a little note there about how they get compromised. The malware literally scrapes through RAM because it knows where applications store passwords. It caches through um, databases. So, for, uh, sorry, uh, cache databases. So, just to give you an example, you could be using Firefox, the modern version of Firefox. What a great browser, super secure. The thing is, if you don't change the master password key and you say to that browser, and I mean, I know none of you would ask a browser to save a password, 
but your staff will let pass. Well, oh, thank you. I'll speed up a tiny bit. I thought I was going fast. Um, if you let your staff save passwords in their browsers and they didn't change the master key, the default master key works. So you can just take the passwords out of the browser. And I won't even get onto Internet Exploder of what you can do to that. Right, so going towards chaos, your endpoints are not clean, your people are inconsistent, time without maintenance leads to vulnerabilities, which is an argument for the cloud. Changing IPIs leads to inconsistencies and chaos, which is an argument for on-premises. Operating systems, libraries, and the packages they have underneath them all create dependencies. Um, to get us back on time, I'm going to not talk about two things. I'm going to talk about how to, let's, how to get control of the, the, the people part of the problem, the wetware part of the problem, but I'm going to skip how to deal with legacy systems, which I do know how to deal with, but I've only got 15 minutes, and how to prevent lateral movement. I might hint at lateral movement, actually, as we go. So, separating people from passwords is a really good idea. Now, I'm not saying separate people from every password. I'm saying just separate people from passwords that can do damage. Let's separate them from the passwords of privileged accounts. Here's an interesting observation. If I ask you to choose a password that is going to protect your identity or protect your bank account, you will choose a good password. If you're asked to choose a, a password on the Monday morning that you've just come back to work and you're irritated, you will just fall into a pattern. And it's that pattern that you want to avoid. Privileged account passwords should not be allowed anywhere near desktops because the desktops are dirty. If you let them there, they will get lost. Now, if you deal with that, you don't have to worry about them being changed all the time, and you don't have to worry about the cognitive overload of having to understand passwords. Remember, you employ your people to do a job, and if you add the cognitive overload of having to understand, not understand, but remember 20-odd passwords, um, you're slowing everything down. In fact, we had that business increase slide earlier, which was great. Um, can't talk about this very much because actually it's the architecture of our product, which is um, an identity in and a roll out thing. Um, but it does look like this. So we end up with a table. Um, I'll just run over here, do this table thing, um, which says that these people can use these tools and these tasks on these systems at these roles, which is a really good way of controlling it. And that's the one from our office. So that shows you the difference between IAM and PAM because you've got individual users having multiple different roles at a management level on machines. Now, the ISO standards tell you that if you've got privileged access to a machine, everybody who's got privileged access should be using their own account. This is a crazy idea. Okay, think about it. If you've got 20 people in an organization that can all access one machine, you've got 20 accounts, 20 opportunities for stupid passwords drop it down to one. Just don't have the accounts. Have a mechanism saying, I know which identity use which role. And you've just taken out, what, 95% of your attack surface if you've gone from 20 down to one, which is cool. Reduce the need for direct access. Half the time, not, no, not half the time. I've got some slides on this. The help desk is nearly 95% repetitive. How many people here and I shall make you wince in your seats. How many people here know of their help desk staff that have got domain admin rights? Yeah, I saw the shift. Okay, yeah, so help desk having domain admin rights is one of the main things that we find and we, we help deal with. Um, if they've got domain access rights, they can go and wander over everything and they've got human error. Um, I won't worry about deterrence at the moment. This is our architecture for getting that done which is to say you can wrap up your tasks into packages and then you use the identity that says you're allowed to use tasks. And if you remember a couple of slides ago, I'll show you that slide. The title of that is a, a slight engineering in-joke. Um, we, we wanted to square everything one of our competitors did. So uh, if you're wondering why it's got all that lot in it, that's what it's all about. That is an example, and it is an example of a vulnerability scanner. So here's the irony for you. Antivirus tools, malware tools, and vulnerability scanners need the very strongest and best accounts to see everything, to check, to see whether it's bad or not. 
So the accounts that you should protect the absolute most are the service accounts that run on your anti-malware tools, and in this case, our Tenable um, vulnerability scanner. Uh, because if you knew the password to the Tenable vulnerability scanner, you'd get the password to just about everything, and you could basically clean out out of ESRX machines and all the rest of it. So there's an irony for you. Your security tools need the best accounts, and so you need to protect the accounts of your security tools. Um, if you do deploy tasks, you can move tasks all the way down to your customer help desk. And this is all about first call resolution. So we deal with a couple of big telecom companies, and one of the things that they have, they deal with business phones, and people with business phones tend to leave them in hotels, lose them, get mugged, um, change departments, and all the rest of it. And one of the classics is that they lose their, ho they lose, lose their phone in a hotel, they get to the office and go, I've lost my phone. They call the provider and say, I've lost my phone. You cannot call them back because they've moved. They've gone to the next hotel. If you can do first call resolution, you can say, yes, I understand you've lost your phone. I'm going to temporarily block it because I know half the time the phone's going to turn up at the previous hotel. And which hotel are you going to next? OK, thank you. I'll have a phone delivered there. That customer then goes off does their trip, gets to the next hotel, picks up the phone, and everything's good. First call resolution. If you have to find that customer traveling between offices and getting to the next hotel, it's going to cost you a fortune. And this actually little Siebel UAT tech is related to that, and it saved our particular customer 226 days, which is good. Um, choosing which tasks to deploy is a little bit of an art, uh, and I'm going to skip over it for a second. Uh, if you want to know about that, you can come and talk to us on our stand, but it really is what takes the time, what's security sensitive, and what can earn your company money, and we end up having what we call tracker meetings about these things, and we understand them, and that's good. So, hopefully I've got a spot on time. Yep. So, in conclusion, PAM and IAM are different. They can both use identity. And when they use identity, really good things happen, but they enter systems with different interfaces. IAMs come through the front door. PAMs all come through the management doors. Your endpoints are compromised. You can't control the digital hygiene of your outsourcers. Uh, in the BBC case, that was a great one. They've got people from all over the place. They can't control their digital hygiene. Your people are vulnerable to phishing, and they choose stupid passwords. Age increases risk. Um, and there are ways of dealing with age-related <laughs> age related system problems, which I won't talk about now, but you can ask me about that later. And if you deal with privileged access management first, all your deliberate issues disappear. So the only thing you've got is a sophisticated inside attacker. If you then change that to a task-based approach, so you're saying, actually, you don't have the credentials, you only have the rights to do tasks, you start to ameliorate or really reduce what an inside attacker could do. Mm -hmm.